I've, I've been coming here for a number of years. Those who have been coming here for a number of years have seen me give at least a half a dozen to eight talks over the years. I try my best to provide new material <laughs> and new information in the presentation. And I, I've had some requests for some information in this presentation, but so I did add some things in here. But I'm going to try to focus today on kind of more cover crops 2.0. So this is kind of like a lot of you already are, know about cover crops because you're in organic agriculture, interested in organic agriculture. Cover crops are not an option in organic agriculture, it's the rule, as opposed to in conventional systems where, uh, you know, obviously in the state of Maryland, cover crops are, are king, but you go outside of the state of Maryland, we forget that only 2% of the U.S. acreage is, in, arable acreage is in cover crops. So, you know, I, while I still, do a lot of work in Maryland. I collaborate across the a lot of states. I work up and down the East Coast, the Northeast. I work nationally with people, folks, and I'll try to reflect some of this in that presentation. But moreover, part of what we have to do is still sell cover crops. You know, there's a lot of folks who are new to this whole thing. And so while Maryland, it feels like everybody cover crops, uh, it's not like that once you get across the state boundaries in a lot of directions. And so, I, you know, some of my program is just really documenting the value and what many of you in this room already appreciate. So some of this will be review. You can nod off and close your eyes during those sections. Mm -hmm. And then some of it will be, you know, some just a more, more advanced theory on cover crops just so that we're thinking very clearly about cover crops and their role in agricultural systems. So, you know, I, I'm, you know, I do think that my whole world revolves around cover crops, obviously, and, and so I, I'm very focused on developing these high residue no-till systems. I, my formal training is in both soil science and agronomy, and I have a big emphasis in weed ecology as well, so that's what I do. I do soil science, I do weed ecology, and I do agronomic research, and all of it really focuses around developing kind of high residue no-till systems. We certainly do a lot of cultivation research in organic grain production, and we do a lot of traditional organic grain production, but we are very focused around how to get cover crops into the system, both from a soil conservation standpoint, but also from a nutrient management, weed suppression standpoint, and water management. So we're looking at a lot of these different benefits. And so, as you know, I'm gonna get used to the fact that I've got two of these. I'll keep turning my head in both directions. As you know, everything we do matters when it comes to cover crops, right? As organic producers, you know that well. It's just like, it, it's just like your cash crop. It's a plant. It's out there. Everything you do matters, from the genetics you're working with, to the time you plant it, to how you place it in the ground, the seed to soil contact, to the, the way you terminate that cover crop. Every single thing drives its performance. And so I just want to classify performance as fitting into this, you know, the biomass quality and quantity. So the quality for simplistic terms is just like it's carbon and nitrogen content. But we're starting to move away from just thinking in terms of quality from carbon and nitrogen. For a lot of the work we're trying to do to develop tools that y'all can use, we're focusing on its forage quality because not all nitrogen is created equal. Not all proteins are the same, right? So cellulose, semicellulose, lignin, all these factors drive how cover crops behave in the environment. So we're kind of moving away from just quantifying its total carbon and nitrogen, but also just looking at the forage quality. And then quantity, you know, just how much you got out there. And so the things that drive this performance, right? So like every farm, every soil, every climate is going to have the optimal performance level. So it's whatever it can be, some whatever cover crop it is, it's going to perform its best at, and it's going to be constrained by these intrinsic factors, climate and soil. There is some maximum potential that a cover crop can perform. And then management, management is what interacts with that performance, right? So here's the best. And that's you know, not necessarily the same on, on farm A, farm B, and farm C. The best could be very different, but the best is the best. And then management gets you somewhere to it. There is probably the optimal management, but no, most of us don't fall into the optimal management. Most of us have to make decisions based on logistics, and that takes us down away from that optimal somewhere. Uh, grasses. So now I'm going to kind of get it specific about two, two you know, life history tra traits, grasses and legumes, and the rest of the presentation is going to kind of link into how they fit in from a nitrogen and water standpoint, but I couldn't help myself. There is one weed slide in there, Bill, on organic no-till, because I, I knew that somebody would want to see something on weeds. 
So uh, grasses, uh, you know, we know they're tremendous nitrogen scavengers, erosion control. That's why the Bay obviously is advocating them is that they're really the, they're the ones that are making the big difference for preventing erosion. And they're just super winter hardy. So you can plant them really late. They still perform. Obviously, they perform a lot worse. I think you said that today in the presentation that, you know, is it worth it to put it out if I'm putting it out in November? Or, or what? I mean, that's the big question, right? As well, how do you get a lot of value out of cover crop if you're putting it out at a time when you're going to get very little fall growth? And then is that economically viable, or is it worth it to have it out there? Uh, but so, but grasses obviously fit into that much better than legumes because they're more winter hardy. Um, and so, when we think about grasses. You know, the grasses can be in various different forms out in that field, right? We can have a young grass that's at that tillering stage, and it's small and it's little or we can have a big cover crop here. And that really affects the carbon to nitrogen ratios. It affects how rapidly it decomposes. And, it, and obviously, why you would grow a cover crop this big is very different than why you would grow it this big. With grasses, nobody in organic agriculture is ever wanting to see a grass look like this unless you're doing that reduced tillage system because that's going to take forever to work up and, it, and you're never going to get a good seed bed and it's going to take forever to, to uh, um, get planted as well as obviously um, cultivate that. So this is, nobody's looking at grasses that look like that in organic agriculture unless you're doing a, a no-till uh, system. So just to kind of review grasses, right? So there's these different stages. There's the tillering, which is what most of you are dealing with when you're not in a reduced tillage application. But even for folks who are doing, you know, like, you know, no-till squash production where they're wanting to grow these big cover crops or pumpkin production, uh, they're going to be pushing towards this further end to like anthesis. So, right? So this is the tillering stage. This is like stem elongation. It starts to get like, you know, a foot or so high. Then the boot stage and then anthesis. And anthesis just means flowering. It's when you see the pollen anthers come out and there's pollen coming off the rye. That's anthesis. And this just represents the kind of range of biomass that you can achieve. So on a low fertility site all the way up to a high fertility site, grasses obviously respond to nitrogen. So this just gives you a spectrum of the performance, right? You know, a very low biomass for tillering, like three to 400, but you can get up this high. I mean, nobody really gets up this high unless you're like got a ton of manure out there and a lot of residual nitrogen, and you might get that from at the tillering stage. But we can even get this high, you know, biomass at the at maturity all the way up to 9,000. Uh, the main thing I want you to cue into and I know I said earlier, we're not going to focus a lot on uh, CNs anymore. We're doing mostly forage quality. That's kind of the next phase of things. We're still right now dealing with this. And so, you know, just, just using this as an indicator of, of quality, you can see that at tillering, it's 18 to 1 versus at anthesis, it's 50 to 1. So do your pounds break or is that dry matter pounds or? Yes, this is, uh, dry, this is dry matter. That biomass is dry matter. Sorry, I should have said that. Everything we present is on a dry matter basis. Um, uh, so it's important when we're thinking about cover crops like this, when, you know, when, if you're, especially, you know, if you're uh, um, uh, growing this cover crops for nutrient scavenging, that rye at 18 to 1 is behaving very much like a legume. That's a very low CN ratio. It's not very different than a legume. So is my next slide the legume now? So, uh, you know, that is a very luscious material at that tillering stage. It's going to decompose rapidly. It's going to release its nitrogen. So we got a bay program that's telling us you can kill your cover crop as early as March 1st because we care about water quality and we're so focused on fall nitrogen. But if you're killing that cover crop March 1st and you're not planting till M May, you've got months of time there where you have a very luscious material that's going to decompose rapidly and release its nitrogen back into the profile. So, just because it's a grass doesn't mean it doesn't decompose fast. It decomposes fast when it's young like that. It's when it gets big that, that changes. And so what does that look like? Oh, I have a slide here before that. So this just gives you an example in the soil profile. So this is, this is and I'm sorry this is in centimeters, but, but I showed you here what a foot looks like. So this is about three feet of depth. So this is nitrogen in the profile, and this is bare ground, and this is early killed cover crop. So right here is March. So if you killed your cover crop in March, this is the difference of the nitrogen in the profile. It's got 45 pounds. This is about 30 pounds of nitrogen in that profile. And this just shows you the distribution of that nitrogen. But the point is, is that's how much nitrogen is. Now, if we go a little later, this is late cover crop termination. So now this is May. So this is right before you're going to plant. This is like the beginning of May. 
Now you can see if that cover crop still keeps growing, it's pulling out another 15 or so pounds of nitrogen out of the profile. Where, so where this is not only not pulling out any more nitrogen out of the profile, this, this early kill, this is killering at the tillering stage. This is killering at like when it's at, you know, anthesis. So this is big rye, small rye, no rye. So in this small rye, this has got 25 pounds it took up and it's gonna sit for two months and decompose and release that back into the profile. This is, uh, takes out another 15 pounds and it's also stored up in that biomass. So that just shows you the difference in how it affects the soil and how does that behave when it decomposes. This is our April 13th and this is our May 20th date. So this is a small rye and this is big rye. Small rye, big rye. Small rye decomposes really fast. So this is just proportion of biomass remaining. So this is going down fast. That means just you're losing a lot of plant tissue fast. It's just decomposing. And, and this is all in a no-till scenario, just to give you a sense. If this is in a tillage, it's going to happen even much faster. And I have a slide about that too. But so look how fast just a small rye decomposes versus big rye. Big rye decomposes slowly, and it releases its nitrogen very slowly. And it really, if anything, is tying up nitrogen when it's really that big. So there's a big, this is just two different years, but it accentuates the point that small rye decomposes fast. So if you don't want it to be a problem with tying up nutrients in your system, getting rid of it quickly is important. And so this just gives you an example now, this just to give you some context of, of how management affects legume performance. So that's part of the, 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 the take home of this presentation is that there is the performance, intrinsic performance based on climate and soil, but then there's management. So this is a complicated slide. Let's just walk through it really slowly together. First off, this is a study that we did across the Northeast, Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, North Carolina, okay? All you guys really care about is that little spot right there. We'll come, but, okay? But uh, you can see, the, and then this is seeding rates. So this is the seeding rate of hairy vetch. So no seeds all the way up to 60 pounds per acre of hairy vetch. And then, Seeding dates, we have the solid line, which is optimal, and a dash line, which is late. So solid line is what you're trying to plant it at. Dash line is you know, often what happens when you can't get it in early, right? And so we wanted to see one, if how, what are these optimal seeding rates? Can you compensate with more, seed, more higher seeding rate if you have to plant it late? How does this all play out? Well, the, thing, the big take home message here is that where you are geographically matters. Because no matter what, in Massachusetts and New York, you just can't produce that much biomass. Look at Maryland and North Carolina, right? We can produce bumper biomass of a legume. In Massachusetts and New York, it doesn't matter what your seeding rate is, your biomass potential is capped. It's limited, right? They can't produce as much biomass. So legumes are expensive. The seed costs are expensive. So the nor as you go further north, go from a south to north gradient. I know that we're more localized here, but you know there are people in the southern regions and folks coming in from Pennsylvania or whatever. Um, as you go north, you produce less biomass and you have to put out more seed. So your dollars per pound of nitrogen, that return on investment, you know the cost of you putting out that seed versus how much nitrogen you get in return, it's a double whammy as you go further north. Us. We really max out and produce a lot of biomass. And what was the most shocking to me, we've been recommending to farmers anywhere 20 to 30 pounds of uh, vetch seed per acre for years. We're able to reach maximum biomass with five to 10 pounds per acre of hairy vetch seed. So that's a big drop in actual seed needs. That's we're cutting in half, if not a third, the cost of, of, of planting this cover crop. And these kind of studies, they just ha are not really well populated. There's just not a lot of these kinds of seeding rate, cover crop performance data out there. So we're trying to t chisel them off the list one at a time, but you can just see in Harry Vetch, we can really re save money by dropping down our seeding rates, still reach maximum biomass, and regardless of our optimal late, we still had really good biomass potential, but, but uh, obviously you do get an advantage from an optimal plant to date. And then this just gives you a sense of plant available nitrogen, okay? So if you're producing in the 1,500 to 2,000 pounds per acre biomass range or whatever it is, 1,000, you know, you're gonna get about eight, 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen. This is plant available. This is not how much total nitrogen is in the plant. 
It's what's available to your crop during that growing season. And this is a single species? This is just, this is just pure vetch, yeah. this study. Yeah. So, but the point is, is that high biomass producing this region, if you optimal produce, you can get 100 pounds of nitrogen pretty easily. But again, remember what I said, if that's tilled in, that nutrients releases into the landscape fast and you have potential loss early on. So while you do get a lot, you do have some potential losses with these legumes a little bit early on. That's why obviously delaying the timing of management and corresponding that with planting is, is ideal. And that's a fall planting. You're showing us an example of a fall planting. Yes. Everything I'm presenting today are all winter annual cover crops planted in the fall killed in the spring. I don't have any summer annual cover crop that's in this presentation. So is that clear? Is that the bottom, is that just a, a cumulative or is that a separate year? Is that like 13, 14? What, this? Yeah, that. This is year one, year two, and year three. Oh. I didn't, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. So a very complicated slide. So we have a north to south gradient. We have year one, year two, year three. Just to show you, we didn't do this one year. We're not telling you things based on one year's data. We're at three years of data here showing you what kind of performance we get. What happened in the third year? Was it just a scurvy year or is it a decreasing return? Uh, why was this a little, bit, a little bit lower in Maryland? Yeah. That's a weather thing. Okay. That's a climate thing for sure. It's, it's just because so the higher seeding rate in some years when you plant late does get you Absolutely. So there's the, there is a great take home message that in, in a year where we had, and I, I had to go back and check the climate that year, but I think that this was a, uh, um, a, a, a either a colder or a drier spring, I can't remember, but um, you can see that yes, in this year, a late planting by increasing your seeding rates from, you know, going from 10 to like 30 compensated some. So by bumping up your seeding rates at a late planting, there was a compensatory effect that you were able to still get higher biomass levels by increasing your seeding rate. And that was one of the reasons we did this study was, you know, if a farmer has to plant late, can they bump up their seeding rates and still get maximum, you know, legume biomass? And so in two years, that it was irrelevant, and one year it played out. And so what is, this is now kind of a, a, a modified version here of what we were just looking at. Now we're looking at pure vetch, rye vetch mixture and pure rye. And this is corn at side dress, fast laying hour sex here. So it just goes you so you over time. This is a tillage based system right here. So what you're seeing here, so what I was saying earlier, is look at this. This is 14 days. In 14 days, almost all of your nitrogen is out of the biomass of that cover crop. Because the cover crop is all this is this is nitrogen released. So in 14 days of tilling in your legume, it's in the soil solution. I'm not saying it's gone. I'm not saying it's down in the bottom of the profile. It's tied up in microbes. It's adhering to the soil surface. It's in different amino acid complexes. I mean, it's not gone, but the point is, is it is at risk of being gone, and that's only 14 days from kill, and your corn is either just being planted or it's like this big. So it, it, there is a synchrony with cover crops that legumes can release a little bit too fast alone, and that's one of the reasons we look at these mixtures, but this is what I was getting at earlier. This mixture and this pure vetch, this is a 50-50 mixture, this pure vetch has the same amount of total nitrogen. Exactly the same. The actual total amount of nitrogen in that plant tissue is the same of the 50-50 grass legume and as the pure legume. But the release rate and the amount that's released during the growing season is quite different. So we have less risk of loss, but we also don't get as much nitrogen. So there's trade-offs. You know, are you losing some when you kill it early and some of it might be gone through leaching and volatility versus losing some that you don't get that season by binding it up with the grass, but then you also get it more t cycling in your systems and, and, and keeping it around longer. So there's trade-offs in all of this. And this is what a no-till application is, and this is obviously why one of the advantages of no-till. Right? Is that you get much slower release. Even the pure vetch has a slower release pattern. And that's because the surface of the soil is not a very hospitable environment to live on. If you're in the soil, you're at a pretty stable moisture and a pretty stable temperature regime. It doesn't fluctuate that much. 
much. It's insulated, right? But when you're on the surface of the soil, the dew gets you soaking wet in the morning, you dry out and you're super hot in the evening, afternoon, you have cold, you have, you have heat. Microbes don't love that environment. So on the surface, decomposition is really affected by this hostile environment and that's why it's much slower. And that's why the release of these nutrients are slower. So leaving these residues on the surface helps you bank your nutrients and get a better synchrony with your crop uptake. If you can do it. Again, I know that, that, that you know, you're, if you're in a tillage-based system, this doesn't really apply to you. And I get that. But we're, we're, we're covering the spectrum. So where are we going with this? We're doing this work all over our station, but we're also doing this work all up and down the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeast. We're working with both the organic and conventional farmers, and we're monitoring these decomposition kinetics of these cover crops, because we're really focused around developing decision support tools. So this would be like web-based apps that you can download on your phone, or you could just go to the internet and get, go onto this app, and you can enter some information, and you can get input about how to manage your nitrogen with cover crops. And so we've been, I mean, it's taking me places that I didn't know we would ever go. We've just hired a computer scientist in the lab. So we now have somebody who just writes these programs and, and is helping build these tools. And so this is an example of a module that we're collaborating with the University of Georgia. Their tool that they created, we're now calibrating that tool for Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina. We're working up and down that whole corridor where our data is being used to calibrate this tool so then this tool will become used and online and available. And it's going to be a tool that NRCS is going to be providing on their website. It's a tool that the Northeast Cover Crop Council will be providing on their website to help make adaptive management decisions. So you enter in information about your fields, uh, your farm, your weather stations that you're linking this to, what cash crops and the dates it was planted, what's your target nitrogen fertilizer rates, what cover crops, um, and then information about residue managed you till or is it no-till. Um, all this kind of information. And then we're also getting folks to send a little grab bag sample, just a small sample to our lab. We got a little quick assay that we do on it, gives us the quality, gives us assess your quantity. And then you get outputs, like this cover crop is predicted to release this much nitrogen. It's expected to release this much in two weeks, this much in four weeks. Uh, this is what your targeted fertilizer rates are. It'll even give you a printout of the release curves of the nitrogen in your soil so you get a sense of what, when is, what nitrogen you're getting and when is it available. So this is all coming. I mean, I think we're less than a year, we're like close to a year out. We've been really working aggressively on improving the tool. We've got a computer scientist now working on all the things that computer scientists do. And uh, eventually this will be you know, a, a very interactive tool. And we're linking this to a whole bunch of other tools. So for example, we're developing species selection tools that farmers who have to make decisions based on their given objectives in their climate, they can, it'll make recommendations on species. The species selection tool is going to feed right into a seeding rate tool, and that seeding rate tool is going to feed right into an economic calculator. So you're going to get species selection, seeding rates, economic calculators, and then there'll be nitrogen recommendation tools, a whole suite of package of tools that are all going to be integrated, and these products will be available to you, and I think we're looking at maybe a year out before some of them start coming online two years before we have kind of the whole complement of products that will be out there. I do want to mention this. This got brought up earlier. I cannot not showcase this because this is my, the, my most exciting thing I've got going on, I think, right now as far as getting nitrogen into organic uh, systems with the interseeder. We are now interseeding into double crop soybeans. And this is just a narrow, this is a 15 inch row versus 30 inch row. This is what that looks like coming out of the soybeans. I mean, this is what it looks like the following season in the spring. It's still not as big as it will get. But we are getting bumper biomass out of this. And I, I, I thought this system was, you know, you know, had some promise. I'm shocked with how well it's working. I mean, we're doing, a, we have a huge thesis chapter on it right now with a graduate student we're looking at. Rye alone, rye with vetch, rye with crimson clover, rye with red clover, rye with Austrian winter pea, rye with forage radish. We're looking at a whole suite of different cover crop combinations of grass legumes. We're doing nitrogen rate studies to see how much nitrogen is coming from those cover crops. But now, in a system where normally our landscapes are just barren and there's nothing growing out there after a double crop application, if you can do a wide row spacing, that's obviously the case here, right? So we're doing that in this study as well. We're contrasting 15 inch versus 30 inch row spacings. And we're going to do an economic analysis of what is the cost, the, bet, the yield penalty of a, 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 narrow, a wide row versus the narrow. I think for full season beans, it seems like it's not a wash, right? I mean, I know that we've been advocating for narrow row spacing, but it seems like with full season beans, all the literature suggests that 
it's not super compelling narrow versus wide row. But on double cop, I would imagine there's a big yield penalty. I haven't looked at that as much, and there's not a lot in the literature on that. I don't know if anybody wants to chime in about this. But most, most conventional producers have no interest in going to a 30-inch row spacing unless they don't have trills, and so they, you know, then maybe they might. But organic producers, I've been learning more and more. I've been hearing that there are folks who are doing wide row double crop soybeans. So if you're planting corn out of this, you basically are just relying on all your poultry litter. And then you run in that risk of jacking up your pea levels. So this is working. I mean, we're still working on it. I'm not making the full recommendation just yet. But I'm shocked with how well we can go into fully canopy double crop soybeans, which we all know doesn't happen very often on wide row, versus you know a thinner stand like this one, uh, or maybe one of these. But um, and it's working. I mean, because all those cover crops have to do is just get out of the ground. In double crop soybeans, they lose their leaves and melt down so fast in the fall. I'm interceding in August or September, so I'm coming in at the end of August or early September and interceding into this, and that's the kind of biomass. This is fall biomass. This is fall biomass, which is, as all of you know, is impressive <laughs> for a grass legume combination in a double crop soybean. Stephen, are you doing that before leaf drop? I mean, it doesn't matter with a drill because you're getting, you're not relying on the mulch of the soybean leaves, but the that's right. We're not. Yeah. So we're like. Uh, uh, so you can go whenever you want. That's the question, isn't it? I mean, we're because we're you know you know how it is. You're always out there just fighting logistics. So you know some experiments got you know planted when it was a bit, bit more exposed somewhere. So we're doing like these light bar measurements underneath where we're measuring how much light goes through the canopy to see you know if we're at a fully closed canopy versus if it's open, how that affects establishment. We have a lot of questions to, think, to fine tune this system, but the fact that it's working this well is really cool. We wrote a SARE proposal on it this past year to try to get funding. It wasn't awarded, but it was in the final pack. So we're gonna try to resubmit, try to get funding, work with farmers in the Eastern Shore. Where anybody who's doing a 30 inch wide row system, we'd be eager to kind of get you into that grant and test, do some test strips on that. Um, this is some of the on-farm monitoring we're doing. I'm not sure why I trained. Oh yeah, now I know why, because I said in my title, I'm also talking about water. So we're, monitor, we're monitoring all on these on-farm, we're doing water and nitrogen. So we're looking at the decomposition of kinetics of cover crops, the end release and availability, crop yields. We're also doing full water budgets. So we're having water sensors at different depths in the profile that are continuously reading data. So if you, you know, we can monitor your water availability in the system. And there's some really cool things that are coming out that we were not aware of. For example, this is rainfall intensity. So this is just, this is like a one inch rain event. Right here is like a one inch rain event, two, three, four, five inch rain event. So big heavy rainstorms that come in, you know, in a six to eight hour period. And what you're seeing here with this line right here that shows no significance, that's a cover crop. And what this is on farms all over the eastern shore. This is data that's each one of these points are farms. And what you're seeing here is that regardless of rainfall intensity, if you've got a cover crop present, that water is getting in the ground and it's staying wet. But if you have no cover crop in your bare soil, <coughs> here, as rainfall intensity increases, you have less and less of that water is infiltrating. And so while, and this is, uh, this makes the point about our systems in general with cover crops and talk about the value of cover crops, but this is in a no-till system where we've been praising no-till as the great practice for water infiltration and storage. Well, it turns out, yeah, no-till is good, but no-till with cover crops is even better. And that's kind of the point here, is that these high residue systems makes a big difference for getting water infiltration, which plays out during the summer. So for example, this is just, I, and again, I know um, the idea here is that I know we have grain farmers, we have vegetable farmers, and some folks are doing high residue no-till systems. I realize this is not applicable to everybody in the room, so I'm just trying to cover a bunch of different themes. Um, but so this is, the, the white here is, is early kill cover crop, the, the gray is a late kill cover crop, and the black here is no cover crop. So again, no cover crop, small cover crop, big cover crop. This is all rye going into corn. So it's all no-till rye into corn. And look at the difference here. This is the different depths of the profile, shallow, intermediate, and deep. And you can see here that late kill cover crops in this, this is, and this is an average over the whole season. So this is weekly water data 
averaged, so this is like the whole season amount of water averaged together, and you can see that you're getting a lot more water through the profile with the bigger cover crops here than uh, no to small cover crops in this one year. And then you can even see here that the no cover crop had less water in it than with cover crops in the shallow depths. And some of that played out here as well. The whole point here is that yes, cover crops represent a water deficit at the beginning of the season because yeah, what plants use water to grow. But in our region, we get a lot of spring water recharge. So we get a lot of that profile recharge uh, with water. But in the summer, having that residue on the surface makes a huge difference in water infiltration and storage and holding capacity. And so having those cover crops and those surface mulch systems really makes a difference for those droughty summers that we routinely experience on these coastal plain soils. And this is just an example of what these outputs so We're actually developing tools now where, where we, you can go, go onto our web link here and you can type in the name. This is on these farms we're doing this on. You can type in your name of your farm and it'll give you, we have all sorts of manipulative outputs where you can look at your zero to four inch or four to eight. You as a farmer can go in and real time monitor the water in your fields and say, okay, this is, this is with the co no cover crop. This is with cover crop, same here. Uh, uh, no cover crop with cover crop and this is what that water looks like during the growing season. So we're kind of developing these apps that as we collaborate with farmers and doing this on farm monitoring, farmers in real time can go out in their field and be like, we're doing this on test strips, right? We have like a 90 foot by 2,000 foot or a 90 foot by 4,000 foot, whatever the size of the field is, of a no cover crop strip. So we'll have the whole field as a cover crop and then this big strip of no cover crop and then we'll take this data side by side, cover crop, no cover crop and monitor the water. Farmer can walk out in their field and be like, that corn looks stressed, that corn doesn't look stressed. Is that real? Is my cover crop actually providing a benefit? Well, let me go look. They can go inside, get on their computer, type their name into this link. They can see, you know, is this a real phenomenon? Is there real some water stress here? You know, is, you know and um, hopefully down the road, we can start using this to help make guiding management decisions. And that's kind of the, the end goal is that we would make these products even more advanced so that they could actually help make recommendations and decisions on irrigation and things like that. Here's my weed presentation slide, Bill. So I got one in there. Uh, so this is the organic no-till system, and I really just wanted to highlight this one piece right here. I just think this is the coolest thing. Um, this is the continuum of, of, of cereal rye to vetch. So this is a no-cover crop, this red. But this, and this is all organic. This is on a long-term organic managed sites, organic no-till. And this is 100% cereal rye is this yellow, and 100% vetch is this purple, okay? So purple, rye, and then just different ratios of the rye vetch together. And then the red is the new cover. And look at that. Sure, we got a lot, this is weed biomass. So sure, over the growing season, V2, V5, V8, this is when it goes reproductive, right? Over the growing season, sure, no cover crop, what you'd expect, lots of weeds, right? You know, you're not, you're not cultivating and you don't have a cover crop there. But look at how striking this is, that a hairy vetch cover crop alone stimulates weeds a ton. So pure legume cover crops in this no-till application is a big stimulant of weeds. But just having even 20% rye in the story, so this light green here, even just 20% rye made a huge difference in reducing the weed biomass in this organic no-till system. So for a while, for years we've been advocating, you know, legume cover crops in their reduced no-till system. Uh, getting a grass in the system is important. And even though I showed earlier that you can reduce your total nitrogen, even very low levels of rye, which is not going to dramatically reduce your total nitrogen, it has big effects on the weeds. There's a number of reasons we could get into that, but I just think this is really striking result, and we saw this in both years of the study. Again, the purple is the vetch, showing big weeds, very little weeds. And for a farmer, where's the action? I mean, this is the action here, right? You know, if you start getting above 1,000, kilograms per hectare, I mean, no, pounds per acre of biomass, that starts to really impact crop yield. That's where that kind of happens. I mean, below this, you're not getting a huge amount of effect on crop yields, but you can start getting above this, that's when you start having yield effect. So I just wanted to close by just cueing you into other, some things that are going on. We are now breeding cover crops. We're focusing on the organic community. We're focusing on legumes, so crimson clover, hairy vetch, and Austrian uh, winter pea. Actually, it's no longer Austrian winter pea. It's just winter pea because we're doing other stuff besides just the Austrian ones. Um, 
Uh, and so we're breeding for traits of interest that we got from farmers through surveys that we've conducted. Uh, this is three years into the project now, nitrogen fixation, winter hardiness, early vigor, biomass production, early and late flowering. The more we talk to folks about what their needs are, the more this program has evolved. We just submitted for another four year round of this breeding program. Uh, so far in clover, we've been breeding for soft and hard seed because apparently some want self-seeding cover crops and clovers are less of a, you know, an issue. In vetch, the, I mean, this is the holy grail right here. If we can get soft-seeded hairy vetch, we feel like everybody would start loving vetch again, right? And that's the goal. I mean, because I still believe that this is one of our best legumes for so many reasons, but we have this one constraint. We're breeding for disease resistance in peas because we have a lot of top trouble, particularly in this region and further south, with performance. And then obviously all of them high biomass, early vigor, and winter hardiness. And this is not a small effort. This is a program we've created that's across the country. So we are developing regionally adapted lines all across the country. We're using the Plant Material Centers Network as well for our screenings and selections. So there are sites all over the country. We have breeders here, breeders here, breeders here. I'm not a breeder. I'm just their contract helper who's doing the screening and selections at our site. But Bark, we're doing screening of all that material. New York, Mar uh, Maryland, and North Carolina, and partnering on farms throughout the Midwest as well, we're doing on-farm participatory breeding, and then the NRCS network. And this network keeps expanding, and as this grows, we're, we're slowly developing more regionally adapted lines, and I, I'd expect that maybe two to four more years we'll start having cultivars that we're, that we're excited about, and, and so, anyway. Lastly, I didn't want to, uh, I wanted to put in a plug, I've mentioned this before, that the Northeast Cover Crop Council is off the ground. This is an organization committed towards, well, here's our mission statement, you can read it. Uh, but define knowledge gaps through data sharing, foster research and collaboration with farmers, provide cover crop best management practices, and then the thing I'm focused a lot on is developing these web-based decision support tools. And so this is a big group. This is uh, industries involved in this, uh, um, seed companies, equipment companies, farmers, uh, and you know we know that, that from the farmer's perspective, you're probably not going to travel around a lot for this conference. It's an annual conference every year, all day meeting like this where lots of talk. It's obviously cover crop centric, but I mean, as we know in the organic community, cover crops are just part of the system. So it's all like whole system kinds of research and extension and outreach and management on cover crops. Um, and then it's, it's how we get folks together. So first year was up in Cornell. We get a lot of New York and New Hampshire and Pennsylvania farmers. Next year it's going to be at Penn State. So please, if you can make it up to Penn State, come on by. And then I'm, ho I'm hoping I'll be the host site next year. So then it'll be in the Maryland area. And that way, folks, this is a way of kind of peer-to-peer -peer interactions. It's a way to get information around cover crops. It's where I don't see a lot of innovation that's going on in the region. And uh, it's where a lot of our science is being provided. So with that, thanks. Steve, you say you're still a few years off you think on the salt? I do think we're still, we're, we're finding, we are definitely finding the spectrum, like we have lines that are much softer seeded than others, so we're getting less hard seed of, along some of these lines, and so we're going to keep doing that selection. There's also some other programs that are taking other strategies to speed up that selection process. But you now we're working with some geneticists in Wisconsin who are actually going to be able to quantify the genes contributing to this, which then we can find the genes that are driving that. Perhaps we can then move speed up the selection, which I'm not saying, I'm not saying molecular, uh, I'm not saying genetically engineering. I'm saying just identifying the genes that are contributing to that hard seed so that when we're selecting lines in a traditional or in this case organic breeding program, we'll be able to be able to more effectively move that germplasm forward faster. But we, we're making progress. I think we're making more progress right now on some disease resistance in the peas. And then, and then this, this separation of hard and soft seed with clovers. Is, is seed hardness just a, a germination issue? I mean, so seed hard, hard I mean, basically, weeds, uh, seeds in general have developed different mechanisms for dormancy, right? So hard seed, it just means is, is a, a type of dormancy. It just means that it has a seed coat that's very impenetrable, right? So in the case of vetch, if you, and I did this study, if you scratch the seed coat off of hairy vetch, if you give it a scarification, that seed can hang out in the soil for six months at most and then it's gone. 
because fungi and different pathogens will attack it. So I, I didn't kind of pursue this, but I did a study for two years at Pennsylvania and at Maryland, and we saw that basically across the board, a bunch of different cultivars of hairy vetch, that if you can bury it for six, after six months, so basically you plant it in the fall, so say you plant it in the fall and you planted scarified seeds. So this like, you know, some seed company provides this added value and they scarify their seeds in the bag. You go and you plant that. Whatever doesn't germinate is gonna be in the soil seed bag. And whatever's in the soil seed bag is represents the hard seed component of hairy vetch. Well, if we scarified that hard seed, whatever didn't come up is gonna be dead by the following fall, so it wouldn't be a problem in your wheat. But I just never got traction. I couldn't find seed companies that were excited about like, you know, taking bulk vetch seed and then scarifying it and then provide, making that commercially available, plus how much would that cost, who knows, how much more cost it would be to buy scarified seed. So yeah, the scarified is actually a mechanical solution, it works, but we're trying to actually breed out the hard seed altogether and hairy vetch and we'll see where that goes. But yeah, there's physiological dormancy, which is like, you know, like pigweeds, for example. Pigweeds are phytochrome response, so they get a light flash and that light flash on their seeds actually stimulates them to break dormancy and begin the germination process. So light, temperature, moisture, oxygen, nitrogen, these are all stimulants to get weeds to break dormancy. Hard seed is more of that physical coat where it's just like an impermeous surface that, that moisture can't get in. And so that's how it has its dormancy. So is the bigger problem with hard seed the, the lack of emergence or the fact that it's emerging later when you have another crop in? Well, the farmers can answer that question. Yeah, the second one. Sticks around, gets in your small leaves. It's just you can't manage it, right? I mean, you can't. You don't know when it's going to come back, and if it's a problem in your wheat, it's a real problem in your wheat. Now, there's two layers of this. You know, if we can be confident that a seed going in is not going to be hard seeded or is it's scarified and it's not going to be a problem, as long as that vetch doesn't produce new seed, as long as you don't let it go to maturity, flower, and produce new seed, then you're, it's no longer a concern. But like in this organic no-till system, that's the other reason why. I mean, I. It's like a nightmare with vetch and the organic no-till system. It just never goes away. So I mean, we're still working on that. But I'm even—I've been working this organic no-till system for over a decade or 12 years, and I'm finally ready to throw in the towel as vetch being a part of that system until we can get that soft seed. Because no matter what we do, you just can't manage it well enough. It still produces some seed, and even then it just. Chemical controls. I mean it's a totally different game for conventional producers. I have no idea why conventional producers are scared of vetch. Honestly, vetch. everything I've ever heard with vetch is don't use it. It can come up all over the place, you yeah. know? Yeah. We That's have, the main thing. It might be an old stigma, but it's still... It's an old stigma. We have lots of good is herbicide control options. Is it expensive? I mean, like, what's the seeding rate? Well, you saw what I presented earlier. I mean, in Maryland, we can get down to five, ten, five to 10 pounds per acre of hairy vetch, which is becomes a very inexpensive cover crop at that point, different than if you're putting out 20 to 30 30 pounds per acre. So an hairy is an expensive it's an expensive seed, hands yeah, down. Yeah. But but if you dial down those seed banks, you're still getting, because vetch is very plastic, it kind of can expand, move around and, and just expand and fill its environment. So, I mean, I, now that I'm breeding, which, you know, I've never done this in my life, you know, all of a sudden we, I'm like looking what a single seed of vetch can do. And I'm like, what? Just one seed produces these big, huge areas. So it's amazing what that plant can do. And so five pounds to 10 pounds is enough, but but if you get it in your small grain in any kind of amount, I mean, you're... Exactly, yeah. You're cooked. You even get the not on the cover crop program and for conventional. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you're anybody allowing vetch in a mixed barley or wheat, is it only because it's dry. Say that again? The Maryland cover crop program allows yeah. vetch yeah. in the mixtures now that they're yeah. allowing. Well, it's part of what the legumes that they... I think yeah, they just broadly said legumes, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, we've got... I mean, the herbicide options for controlling vetch are there and they work well. We've never had problems in our conventional systems. We have lots of long-term systems, and we don't have any issues with vetch in our wheat. In fact, we even have organic tillage-based systems where we're not having issues with vetch in our wheat, but that's another application. But we, like, in our tillage-based systems, we till vetch, so all that we have that's left is just that 10, 5% hard seed that's in the soil. Then the following year, we're planting soybeans, but we're, chisel, we're chiseling, so we're not inverting, so any of the seed 
that when we put when we incorporated the vetch, we plowed that, we buried the vetch seed, the five percent. Then we chisel our soybeans so that that stays down there, and then we chisel our wheat. So we have we have a long-term organic system experiment for twenty years that we've been using vetch in, and we don't have a single issue of wheat of vetch when in our wheat. When is vetch plowed? Usually, I mean, when it goes to seed, like when when are you looking to burn that down? May it'll it'll flower. So as long as you kill it before it flowers, and as long as you're plowing and burying that vetch before the corn and then your subsequent crops in the rotation don't invert the soil uh, for a number of years. I mean, I, I mean, I know that folks are, are very hesitant about vetch. We're, we continue to think it's an important cover crop, so we're working on it. Obviously, the hard seed issue is why we're trying to get around the fact that folks are scared about it. But even in our long-term organic systems where we have wheat, we don't have a problem with vetch. But that's because of the pattern of tillage, plowing, of chisel, and inverting that we have in there. But any, any way you twist it and turn it, in a conventional system, we have many very effective herbicides that work really well on vetch. And I mean, 2,4-D and glyphosate are very effective on terminating vetch, big vetch. So I'm not sure why it has such a stigma in the conventional community as well, but I, I know everywhere I go, nobody wants to hear me talk about vetch. <laughs> uh, I think we missed something, but isn't it interseeding in the double crop soybeans? I mean, that slide you showed it looked like a potential for a real harvest problem there. Yeah, I, because I, I, I didn't, I didn't adequately say that right here. So this is, this is that harvest right here. This has already been harvested, so it's gone. So maybe you, you were thinking of this, but we came in here and it, it didn't seem to slow down our combine speed. We're going in there with big combines, and you have to remember, it, from a distance here, it looks really thick, but this is really spindly little. Gr grass, right? Because it's been growing underneath a canopy. It didn't, it's not like charged up and been going for a month. So it's, it's thin, it's wispy. When you go through that, you just give it a, a little tiny haircut as you're going over the top of that. Uh, and the, and the, most of the legumes are just sitting close to the soil surface anyway, so the combine doesn't really bother it. In the organic with the cultivator ridges you have, already have, the that's right. Skimming across the top of the ridges, you don't get any. Okay, that's, that, mine, that's right. Not a yeah, this this here is a no-till conventional uh, demonstration of this, but yeah, in the organic thing, it's even yeah, you have more of a V. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. uh, what, what, how far along do you still have green leaves on when you interseed it? What was your date when you interseed it? Oh yeah, I, I, like, I, like I I guess I I, I thought I, um, the, the soybeans was either reproductive or just before reproductive, and so we're looking at end of August, early September. I'm shooting for mid-August, that's my goal. I originally started doing this in the beginning of August, and I noticed that interceding stuff I did in the beginning of August versus the end of the August, the end of August did better. And I was like, well, why is that? It's, it's less light, but I don't know, maybe because it's in later, more in tuned with when a winter annual would be planted, that it did better. So I just stopped going early August and, and just and, and I'm very amazed with how little damage there is to the soybeans going into these wide row beans, but you know they can be pretty close together, and we just go right through it. And, and we, there's a lot of, we're only like, you know, we've only been doing this for like three years, so I mean, I'm not recommending the practice by and large. We're just demonstrating that we've got some good promise here, and we want to keep testing it. Troy, you're working. So what Bill's asking about is um, we just purchased a machine from Australia that is called the Harrington Seed Destroyer. And it's supposed a machine. It's supposed to destroy vetch, right? It's supposed to destroy weed seeds. Vetch, actually, I don't think it would destroy at all because it only destroys the weed seeds that are going through the combine, right? So if you're a foxtail and you drop your seeds early and the combine comes through the field, you know, you're not a candidate. But pigweed, lamb's quarter, uh, jimson weed, uh, those are high candidates for this practice. And so what happens is we bought the early prototype. They've, they've less left, left us in the dust. So we're already, you know, out of date. <laughs> so the new system is the IHSD, the integrated HSD, because now combines are big enough to drive this machinery. It's built into the combine and pulverizing. So it's pulverizing weed seed as it goes. And this is now becoming a mainstream practice in Australia where they have significant herbicide resistance issues. Now that resistance is becoming such a big issue here, uh, we were able to get a grant to get that funded to bring it here. And so this machine essentially attaches to the back of the combine. The 
the, the trash goes out the back of the, of the uh, combine, feeds into a conveyor belt that goes underneath the HSD, so to speak, and just shoots out uninterrupted, undisturbed. So it's not like you're just pulverizing everything that goes into the combine. The bulk of the chaff actually gets back into the field as intact. But then the fines, which is where all the weed seeds are, that goes pushed back into the back of the combine and then it kind of filters into this, this chamber and it goes through this, this cage mill and it pulverizes all weed seeds that go through there and then shoots it out the back in a fine powder. Uh, and its efficacy is, in, is incredibly high. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're still documenting that because we're only about a year and a half to, into this project. Uh, but um, I think this has huge promise for organic producers as well. And so we're just we're working out the kinks on this herbicide resistance project. But that is my goal. Next step is to try, start partnering with organic farmers. My, my farm crew will not let me bring this machinery onto any farms where there's resistance. So my ability to test this technology is limited because they don't want me to bring any resistance back to the farm. So, uh, you know, weed seeds have a habit of hiding in machinery no matter what you do. You can't clean it perfectly. Is it only applicable at the combine or could it be set up at a grain dryer? I mean, you get a lot of, yeah. a lot of weed seed comes out of grain dryer. Uh, I can't imagine why it wouldn't. I mean, this is, I mean, you basically set up the machine stationary. You'd have to have to have hose work pushing it into the cage mill. And then, but I mean, it's, it's only meant to grind the stuff that's separated off. It's not going to separate it within there. Right. You'd have to do your own separating separation mechanism. But yeah, I imagine that it would work in that application. But I think it's a great tool for organic farmers because what's our biggest weed on organic farms in this region? It's like pigweeds, right? It's like one of our biggest problem species. So if you can go in, this thing it basically takes all above ground seed production and pulverizes it. We haven't quantified how much shakes to the ground when the thing's going through the fields because you know, you're always going to have some disturbance of the machine. But, but what goes through the machine, almost all of it is pulverized. And it's, for organic producers, as you know, that's an enormous amount of seed that's not being returned back into the system. So, I mean, that's, that's part of this whole system management, right? The, one of the ways we can get organic no-till to work is just be producing less seeds back into the system. So if we can be pulverizing the weeds that are problems in that organic no-till system or just in the tillage-based systems in general, this is a way to basically get a big advantage in the organic system because for us, no matter what we do, we're still getting the weeds that are coming up in the row, and those weeds that come up in the row are, are often uninhibited in the soybean system from producing a lot of weed seeds. So we're getting there. We got, we'll, have, we'll have information, I think, in a year. How much does one cost? The machine we got is exorbitantly expensive. It's, it's, it's incredibly pricey. It's like, I think, I, I think 170,000 to get the machine, to get the, the, to buy the machine, then like 10,000 to get it here, another 15,000 to modify the combine, to work with it. But the new technology, the IHSD, I think they're like not only under 100 grand, but maybe even significantly under 100 grand, and they're integrated into the combine. So like I'm towing behind, you know, this thing's like 30 feet or so, at least behind the back of the combine that I'm driving through fields with that this is connected to. So the new system is just built into the combine. So how could farmers experiment with this? I mean, is There's it two of them in the country right now. Mm -hmm. There's one in Illinois, my partner in Illinois, and there's one here in Beltsville. And I, my, I am now capable of bringing it on farm. So I, you know, I have the combine, I have the HSD, I am capable of doing on-farm testing. We have a farm crew that would be willing to do that. The main reason is the main project that was in right now is a herbicide resistance project. And that, you know, I've been forbidden to bring it on to herbicide resistant farms. But organic producers that don't have resistance issues, yeah, that would be a pl applicable place that we could t do demonstration trips and test this technology. But it's just for pulverizing. It's not sorting in any way, shape, or form. So it, it's just pulverizing your, your chaff. Your not the whole chaff, just the fines just that the contain fines. the weed seeds. Just the fines. So, okay. Right. So any weeds, and so we have studies up and down the whole uh, U.S. right now. It's a team of 17 weed scientists that are doing this, where we have all the different relevant weed species that we can track in our systems. We're quantifying the pattern of seed rain of these weeds. So when do they drop their seeds? So we're trying to basically document across the country which weed species are candidates for this technology. Because if you drop your seeds before harvest, you're not a candidate. You have to retain your weed seeds up till harvest, and then you would be a candidate for this. But the fortunate news is that some of our biggest pesky resistance issues and our biggest pesky weeds in our organic systems are weeds that this works for. 
lamb's quarter, you know, pigweed. You had a slide earlier talking about your cover crop nitrogen availability calculator, and it showed a dap den. Is are you tying in with that in some way, or? Is that I should have uh, I should have said something about that. Um, yeah, it's like a relic of a previous presentation I gave that was kind of for that audience. But so. Um, a lot of the data I presented today, a lot of that data was used by the Adapt N team at Cornell to calibrate their model to build their cover crop module. And it's a great product. It's a great product. And that product then got commercialized and sold. Uh, and while we're very excited about that product, we feel like we've got a lot of work to do on, on this whole nitrogen game. And so we're, it, it's, we need to work with a team that's going to work with us. And once it got privatized, you know, it's like at, we can't really inform that product. So we're doing this all. We're developing our own open source technology with our own, you know, creating, we're, we're uniting the cover crop councils across the country to develop national databases and then develop these open source tools where it's built on a platform that is modular and, and interacts so we can develop tools. So if like NRCS develops a climate tool or an economic calculator or a soils tool, those tools can go right into our platform and connect and interact and, and communicate with each other and, and not be proprietized. Now, if we develop a product that a private company likes and wants to pick up the guts of that product and put their own interface on it, the interface being like the website, right? Uh, sure, we'd be amenable to those kinds of things, but we want to be able to have influence of the guts of the product and be able to improve it. You know, there's a lot of knowledge that we don't have just yet. And so a lot of these tools, these recommendation tools, like these seeding rate tools and these species selection tools and nitrogen calculators, they're based on expert opinion, all right? They get a couple guys together or a couple gals together from a state and they're like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And so then they kind of come up with some values and, and so that's what informs some of this. Now, Adapt-N is not that way. Adapt-N is a highly you know, developed process-based model that has a tremendous amount of development to it, so I don't want to suggest in any way that that tool is a very comprehensive, substantial, really well done product. But we have like other tools that are more based on expert opinion, right? And if we want these tools to interact and we want to be able to continuously improve them, and put our stamp, like if the cover crop councils want to put their stamp of saying, hey, this has been supported by 15 scientists up and down the East Coast saying, yes, we agree with this information. We're not trying to sell you anything. We're just trying to give you good information. Then at least we could keep working with the product. And so that's why we started working with the Georgia team on their tool, because they're amenable to kind of expanding the range of that tool. To yeah. So but it is adaptive nitrogen management, just not adapt and mm -hmm. The brand. The brand, yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. One more. Anything amiss for the small scale vegetable farmer? <laughs> uh, I mean, everything we do here that we talk about related to cover crops and management, those principles are across the board applicable to small and large scale producers. So, how cover crops influence nitrogen and water and weeds. I mean, those, I mean, I try my best to be principle-based when we're possible, but the reality of it is, is I certainly do focus more, you know, most of my creative thinking is geared towards grain systems. Yeah. But uh, we, we develop information that we try to provide a spectrum. So not everybody might be interested in some part of the spectrum, but there are producers that will be interested in some parts of it. And that's what, why we try to design questions that may have treatments in it that most producers are not interested to, but oh, but these over here, like, like the soft-seeded clover, right? I mean, the hard seeded clover, like nobody's asking for hard seeded clover except like a select group of, in like Georgia and North Carolina that want self seeding cover crops of clover because it works in their system. And so we're like, all right, we'll add that in there. Anyway, we have a meeting that's right after this meeting. Uh, so a lot of this on farm data that you saw on water and nitrogen, the group of farmers that have been involved in that project are going to be meeting in this room here. So we're going uh, to need to take over this room. But thank you. <laughs>